All right. Um, we'll get started. Uh, a few minutes passed. Hopefully, uh, you know, we have 13 people. That's a good number. So let's get started. So um, hopefully, everyone has the uh, deck in front of them today. Um, you know, first off on slide three, uh, is there anyone new to the call that would like to kind of introduce themselves uh, that wasn't here last uh, last time or before? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Paul Osman. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. we hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Yeah, my name is Paul Osman. Um, I run a team here at Under Armour Connected Fitness. So we're yep. the ones who build Met My Fitness and My Fitness Pal. Yep. Um, we've been doing game days for a while. Um, you know, we're enthusiasts of chaos engineering and uh, just interested in checking out the group. Cool. Thanks, Paul. Anyone Hi. else? Uh, oh. Yeah, uh, I'm Deepak here, uh, Deepak Sarda. Uh, I'm actually in a personal capacity today. Uh, I work for a fairly large uh, financial services company. Um, I run a chaos engineering program there. Trying to make that involvement official, but uh, as of today, it's just personal. <laughs> cool, welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you loud and clear. My name is Geeta Gopal. I'm from Capital One. I run the identity and access management team for Capital One, the external consumer identity platform. And I also own the team that, that does a lot of chaos engineering. Uh, we've just gotten started about six months ago. Cool. Well, well, welcome to the group. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Cool. Uh, we'll, we'll move on. So um, <clears throat> slide five uh, essentially um, kind of gives an update on where we are with uh, building out a landscape. So I'm not, not sure if uh, a lot of you are familiar with kind of the um, cloud native landscape that CNCF puts together. If you go to l.cncf.io, you kind of take a gander on it. We're trying to do the same thing for chaos engineering. Um, I've essentially taken the liberty of putting together a spreadsheet, I'll paste it in the Zoom chat, of basically the one technologies that essentially in projects I found out there that um, are kind of the more popular and widely used end. Um, I would love to get a sanity check uh, from folks on um, basically the tools out there that are on this list and tools that may be out there that are not on this list because um, I would love to basically get all this information collected so I could do a pull request and get our kind of first cut of the chaos engineering landscape uh, that plugs into the, the CNCF landscape. The other thing that um, I think we discussed last time uh, with Uma and some other folks was how do we categorize the different tools out there? It looks like Uma, you've suggested uh, some subcategories. Um, I believe that was you, but um, it would be good to kind of get feedback from the group because you know some of these tools um, you know, are hosted offerings, some of them are not, some of them focus maybe on a specific area just around storage. Uh, but um, kind of the, the categorization problem is something that has plagued us at least in terms of, um, you know, trying to bring some organization to this list. I mean, we could keep it as simple as just saying like, we have one category, all this kind of just fits under category, uh, chaos engineering to start. Uh, and then maybe later on, we kind of play the game of trying to break things out um, in, into uh, more concrete and discrete uh, categories. Uma, do you want to share any thoughts? Because I believe you were the one that came up with these categories last time. Right. Uh, I believe uh, there was a good comment from, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you loud and clear. Okay. Um, there's a very comment from Matt, uh, you know, a couple of days, a few days ago. So the idea here is, you know, chaos engineering is, you know, a lot of tools out there, some in small capacity, some in specific to introducing a particular type of chaos. Um, uh, while there is a, a reasonably good effort we are trying to make where, you know, uh, try to get a litmus uh, as a framework or a, an orchestrator uh, to get, uh, um, you know, started uh, with chaos engineering as a general uh, practice uh, while there is an application movement or uh, you know, the administrator. Um, so the idea here is, you know, let's define something uh, that belongs as frameworks 
which are the communities and put tools into that framework. And uh, then that framework uh, could also be more focused around uh, either infrastructure chaos or application chaos or network. Um, inside the uh, uh, infrastructure, there are multiple types, right? So um, it related to compute or network or storage. It's just one top this, and uh, I read Matt's comment where he says, um, let's, let's do a layering, right? Uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, sorry, the guy has to be introduced at a layer. So let's define layers. And uh, he talks about the station of the layer. And I like that idea as well. Um, okay. I'll take a, a look at it and try to appreciate it. Okay. Um, but that's my thoughts is. Okay. Appreciate the comments, Uma. Any other thoughts here before we um, move on to community presentations? I think if we are going to be categorizing, it will also be useful if we think about the target of cat, uh, chaos. Uh, like a, There's a bunch of tools focusing on Kubernetes, so it will be interesting to see what el, what other platforms are getting active attention, you know, AWS, yeah. Azure, whatever it is. You know, yeah. some, some categorization that will be useful. So that was a little bit on uh, what I touched on in the sense of like it was OS versus like uh, provider versus containerization yeah. or orchestration layer. So I think definitely. All right. You know, my, my suggestion is we'll keep hammering away on this and continue discussion on, on GitHub. Um, I have a feeling I kind of just want to start with something um, simple and just get kind of tools there, that, tools on a landscape. And then from there, we kind of divide and figure out how to lay um, things out. Uh, all right, so slide six and seven. So we got two community presentations today, one from the uh, Pumba team and the other from the litmus team. I believe uh, Alexei is going to go first to talk a little bit about uh, Pumba and kind of what it does and, and, and where it fits into uh, the chaos engineering landscape. So Alexei, are you there? Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah, good. Good to hear. All right. The, <clears throat> it's yours. Feel free to share your screen if you want to or do whatever, do whatever you need to. Just okay, share screen. Share screen. Fine. Okay. Oh, perfect. And do you see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. So let's make it small. So a uh, few words about Pumba. First of all, it's a well-known uh, uh, Disney supporting character from the Lion King, as you know. On uh, Swali, Pumba means to be foolish, silly, weak-minded, careless, neglect. So I think that the name is quite represent the idea behind the tool. And uh, it's a command line tool for chaos testing for Docker container. So I started this uh, journey two years ago when I was working on, on one project with a lot of microservices involved. We use Docker. And uh, thus, it was uh, CoreOS uh, fleet orchestration engine. And uh, I was enthusiastic about uh, trying uh, chaos, chaos testing uh, on this project. And uh, I read a lot about uh, chaos engineering and chaos monkey. But uh, when I searched for a Docker tool, container specific tool, I failed to find one. So uh, that, that's why I decided to, to create one using a Docker API starting from simple scenarios. And that's what I have today from time to time. I maintain this project uh, till now, extended, uh, fixing issues and enhancing it with uh, people's suggestion. So uh, the project itself, as I said, is a common line tool. It's a, a single binary for, for all platforms, for Linux, Windows, Mac. So what Pumba can do, it actually can support a Docker runtime environment and inject different failures. Like uh, you can specify the victim container 
using names, IDs, or regular expression, you can introduce <coughs> Randomness is a random flag, random container, not all containers. So define this chaos test. Uh, so Pumba can disturb either single Docker host with multiple containers, so Docker uh, or Swarm cluster, or containers running in Kubernetes cluster. Uh, basic commands like with uh, Docker, this is what I started with. It uh, able to stop running, stop and restart running container, uh, killing or sending uh, any termination signal, Linux signal to the main process within Docker container. Remove container together with its links and volumes and pause uh, all processing within container for specific, uh, specified time. So switching to short demo, I split uh, horizontally. Okay, so as I said, do you see my screen, right, guys? Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. Okay, so Pumba, as I said, it's a, it's a command line tool. You have several commands and multiple sub-commands within command with a lot of parameters you can connect the local uh, Docker host or the remote Docker host with TLS certificate, etc. So I will uh, run uh, multiple, uh, several containers uh, that uh, do nothing. Just increase the default so you can see it. Okay. So seven containers doing nothing and I'm going to I'm going to run a kill command, uh, select a random container from uh, running containers, uh, every and repeating the, the same uh, every five seconds. Uh, so, so sorry. So I see a container up and running, and they start to exit one by one. And in the log, you can see that it find containers and select containers to kill and send the sick kill. It's possible to specify the signal and uh, to do other stuff. Okay. So it's done. Yeah. And let's take a look at what, what else it can do. It can, as I said, it can uh, kill, it can uh, pause, it can, you can specify this, the termination signal, you can use a regular expression, and uh, you can also pause container process within containers, also some valuable scenarios. And next uh, thing after that, uh, I, Added capability to, to, to create network emulation, to, to, to emulate network failures at the container level. So things like a delaying uh, all angry traffic, to, uh, introducing packet loss, or defining a rate limit. This is currently supported network emulation uh, disciplines. Uh, and uh, just to demonstrate it, I will show. Uh, okay. Let's run uh, some ping command. Okay, I'm running ping to uh, to some DNS, just comment. For some reason, it does not work. And to be able to show, it's another one. Oh. 
。哦。Okay. So, so for some reason, I cannot issue the ping command right now from my Docker machine, so I cannot show the latency delay, but I will show the different scenario. I will show the packet load scenario. It, it will be local network. And uh, split horizontally. No. Split vertical. I am adding a IPF tool for, for the server and for the client. Uh, so I start the IPF server. So I have one. Okay, and so I'm starting here IPR service, just need to remember how to start it. Uh, have the comment copy paste. So it's server, it's a listening for the traffic and I start the client sending a packets for let's say 60 seconds so you can see the packet start arrive with a zero packet loss and i start the pumba command on client uh, to introduce the packet, packet loss here So it's a uh, for 20 seconds. I will use uh, I will add packet loss 20 percent with correlation of 10 percent. And you can see on the right uh, bottom pane that there is, there are packet loss. If I stop it, it will uh, restore the connection. Okay. Uh, What's uh, behind the scene? Well, as I said, it's possible to, to introduce the delay and packet loss and uh, rate limit. And behind the scene, I'm using a uh, control program, either in, uh, available inside the container, or I, if it's not, I inject the container into the same network namespace as the target container. Okay, and for the next plans, uh, I think to extend it to support uh, Kubernetes native chaos testing, uh, introducing chaos for services and resource and network in Kubernetes cluster, not only at container level, but also at Kubernetes entities level, and uh, adding public API possibly compatible with chaos toolkit as it defines. I need to drill down and see how I can make it uh, compatible. And that, that's all. Well, th <coughs> thank you, thank you, Alexei. Does anyone have any questions for any Alexei? Questions, guys? Sure. Um, yes, uh, Alexei, hi, this is Uma uh, from the Litmus team. So first of all, uh, thank you for this um, great tool. We use um, Pumba for introducing the network chaos uh, in one of the the Ansible playbooks. Um, 
uh, actually answered my question in the last slide. Um, you know, uh, this tool is great, uh, but most of the teams are moving towards uh, some kind of an orchestration to manage uh, their workflow, uh, particularly Kubernetes uh, being the most interesting one. So it would be great, um, you know, to have some effort going on to have this working with Kubernetes, uh, which you said already you're going to do. And uh, we'll see you know, if we can find some bandwidth uh, to contribute because we are already using this uh, in the Litmus framework. Um, just wanted to voice out that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, I actually, it's open source project I, I lead it. And guys, I'm I'm more than happy if you decide to contribute to help with ideas or pull request or put so anything. Yep. Uh, Thank you. Other okay, Chris. Um, cool. <laughs> Thank you, Alexei. Um, <laughs> next up, I believe we have uh, Uma and the uh, Litmus team. So uh, you're here, Uma. So you're welcome to start steering now. All right. Uh, let me just uh, share my. Screen. Yeah. Perfect. I see your screen. So All right. go for it. Great. All right. Um, so thanks, Chris. Um, so Litmus um, uh, is, is basically uh, a combination of uh, many things. It all started from uh, doing chaos engineering from uh, our own open EBS uh, project development. Um, we were faced with uh, an interesting scenario, uh, you know, storage being the most difficult one to get the accepted quality levels. Um, so we started writing a kind of a negative test uh, within the team and uh, in our end-to-end -end framework. <clears throat> we started seeing, you know, from a couple of uh, users in the community that, um, you know, uh, I'm using your product, uh, but um, you know, when something happens, things are, you know, not behaving exactly the way we want, right? So we wanted to give um, a good framework for our own users to uh, test their applications which are using the underlying uh, storage, which is open EBS. That's really how um, the Litma is born. We then thought, uh, let's have a good view framework and that introduces that a lot of uh, functional tests or scalability performance, but mainly, you know, negative test uh, that gets used either in the application or in the infrastructure or in storage, uh, any layer. We wanted a good framework and um, that we called it as Litmus. We opened it up in a more usable, um, you know, form than our current ET framework is. We just put a, a structure on how end users can use Litmus framework, or I like uh, Matt's uh, categorization uh, of Litmus orchestrator, right? So imagine, um, you know, it as a Kubernetes, how you see Kubernetes as a, a framework, get your application deployment uh, and then planning on. Third way you can think of Litmus as you know, a tool or not really a framework uh, to plan and uh, engineer the chaos into whatever you're doing, right? Uh, you may be doing application development, then you have a certain way of planning chaos and getting some uh, expect results out. Or if you're doing, uh, you know, DevOps orchestration as an architect, uh, you use Litmus in, uh, in your own way. So that's really how uh, Litmus is born. And who can use Litmus? Uh, it's almost uh, two categories. Uh, I would I have four here, but primarily um, application developers uh, who are, um, you know, most database related stateful applications uh, that are interested in uh, testing how uh, again, uh, application works under certain conditions, uh, mainly negative scenarios, right? I, I have a real use case uh, going uh, into slides below. 
And the other one is uh, the DevOps architect. This is where we expect uh, most of uh, the crowd will really, uh, you know, attract litmus um, to uh, DevOps architects have uh, you know, an interesting job of making sure that whenever in, you enter a change, uh, you have to certify um, that change that things are going to be okay and they're going to be working for a uh, given set of developers, right? And the change could be as simple as, you know, upgrading Kubernetes from one layer version to the other version. So how well uh, I, as a DevOps architect, certify that everything's going to be okay because I'm actually using a big change. Oh, well, of course, you know, Kubernetes must have been well tested before release. We all know that, but I still have the responsibility to make sure that my particular environment uh, is all going to be okay. So you need a framework for DevOps architect to run certain tests before uh, I say, you know, you can start uh, moving towards this platform. So that's where uh, Litmus can help you. And uh, more importantly, you know, as we develop Litmus as a community, uh, there may be uh, many test suites that are um, specific to a given application. For right? example, uh, MongoDB, Cassandra, MariaDB, um, they may be interested in adding uh, specific Kios tests uh, that are related to their own database so that you know, uh, their users can actually uh, load this test suite uh, and run it uh, in Litmus. Similarly, uh, we thought, you know, just because OPS is having a tail list of tests and also contribute something, some similar tests to Kubernetes local P, other switch vendors uh, uh, can provide can also start contributing more specific CAS tests that are related to their own application, for example, Glasser or Rook, um, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And um, it could also be for network providers, you know, Tegra or other uh, open source projects, right? Uh, it's almost for everyone because it's just a framework with a set of tests. And we'll go into um, details, probably I'll... So in this presentation, I not have a tail demo, um, um, actually because, you know, we're still trying to put together YouTube framework uh, into a little form. So uh, you know, a couple of uh, guys are busy and probably they'll be available for next uh, next session to do the deep demo. But, uh, let me explain what really Litmus is. Right? <clears throat> Litmus uh, is really uh, at a core, it's a Kubernetes job, uh, find or designed to do a particular job. And uh, you can define what the job is, and uh, it's framework or an orchestrator to run the job. And um, the framework contains a lot of ansible test cases, right? And you can really think of this test uh, case or a playbook is really independent of each other. You have a, a set of end-to-end functionality done into playbook and they are defined uh, and uh, put out there so that anybody can run the test. Um, it is really standardized and sometimes customers were given workers. For example, we might uh, configure even MySQL application with a particular parameter and then customize it. Uh, so you need not uh, take it from the chart of my deal that's out there, but if it's customized, it will be available in the Litmus repository, right? So you can consider it as workload containers, both standardized, in which case you have a YAML file, it is customized, it will be available in the Litmus repository. And also, um, it will have a, a set of tools. Uh, Pum is one, Calculate uh, is a one. So these test cases may uh, you use of in these tools to really create that Ansible playbook, right? For example, whatever Alexi has uh, uh, demonstrated, introduce a network delay uh, between a point and server, uh, that embedded in an end-to-end test of deploying a MySQL application, doing some load, then Pumba coming and uh, introducing some uh, network delay and then observing whether MySQL has 
really perform as expected or not, right? That entire thing is a test case, right? And that's what uh, Let's will have. And you can actually check out, um, clone the repo uh, and then change it and then start executing. So it's really designed as a easy to uh, start uh, kind of generating a given application to verify whether your application works or not. There's some chaos. Um, and then really we are also thinking of providing uh, Kate as deployers uh, for anyone to start, um, you know, uh, an end to end test. Uh, you need to have um, a Kubernetes uh, clustering, and it's not always as simple as uh, in, um, running a test case and deploy a Kubernetes code. It will become difficult uh, task. Right? So we do have uh, some deployers, uh, mostly engineered and uh, well known tools like Kubernetes uh, or QDM. Uh, you can choose one of them and then up your uh, Kubernetes uh, clusters. So this really starts, um, you know, being and to get started uh, resisting their applications and then starting them into the city. And then for some probably specific deployments, this is more of a future um, uh, concept. We have that for open EBS right now. What it really means is um, you have, uh, it's a kind of a global framework um, open EBS is is uh, been into the Litmus uh, framework um, and uh, you, through some API and uh, cluster or a Rook or somebody else can uh, use API and then make it available for uh, Litmus users. Um, so we don't have a lot of it written. What we have today is really uh, this uh, job framework and uh, summable test cases. And uh, we have E2E tests that are related to these different applications. We are in the process of moving them into latest. And our original end-to-end -end framework is also open source. And uh, in, in about a few weeks, we'll be moving all uh, uh, application tests into the latest framework. And another important um, use of Litmus is how you really um, this in an automated way into the DevOps uh, planes, right? And you, if you see um, this uh, diagram of the end of your regular, end of your regular pipeline and before you actually uh, go into the deployment, you actually plug in um, uh, Litmus there to do some optional tests. Uh, it is expected to be ready available with minimal integration into your CI pipeline. You could add a lot of uh, already well done tests into your pipeline. And this is how uh, we expect um, the DevOps architects to make use of MS uh, to, to, to get uh, immediate benefits of uh, you know, how application behaves under CAS. <clears throat> Let me quickly uh, uh, summarize by how any any user uh, as a DevOps architect or developer can make use of Litmus by describing it as use case. So I will define uh, Jeffrey as a DevOps architect uh, whose job is actually to um, manage a large Kubernetes cluster that runs multiple services in different namespaces. Uh, he's really responsible for making sure that Kubernetes is up and running and the developers are using that Kubernetes platform. If that is the case, one of the key responsibilities would be, you know, the class questions and whether you are compatible with uh, all the <coughs> uh, compatibility services that are being offered uh, are going to be doing same when you move one version to another version. So what uh, Jeffrey as a DevOps architect can do here is to list uh, 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 some of the test tests uh, at the end of um, uh, his regular test cycle and let must, let must actually put out the results whether it must or not. So uh, just imagine, you know, you have, um, you're at the beginning of this journey and there are a bunch of that are uh, well used by community that can certify uh, that um, uh, all the applications are actually working fine. You might have a MySQL server or 
other data sets, all are going to continue to find even after upgrade. So it's expected to make uh, you know a lot of product improvement uh, when it comes to uh, DevOps being agile, right? And then uh, the other one is application developer. Applications developers are um, not expected to introduce chaos uh, uh, into the infrastructure. So what has can be introduced is probably defined by uh, administrator, right? In this case, uh, Jeffrey would have already uh, provided some namespace restrictions uh, or to or back restrictions. Uh, on what type of um, uh, chaos can be introduced at networks, RAM or disk conditions. Jan, uh, Jan provides um, um, this list of details, uh, what uh, Litmus give back uh, at the end of test um, that has gone into his application testing. And Jeffrey uh, would basically give uh, certain type of feedback back to his developers that hey your application really not do the disruptions properly so um, you know this this application is not really uh, good enough at in, into the regular pipeline so I would expect uh, you to go back and do um, for disruptions logic properly your application so I'm um, the application and continue to add more and more uh, negative application developers can all add more and more negative test cases into the uh, litmus framework so uh, where's litmus really uh, is um, it's in, uh, right right now it's still part of an open eba project um, and uh, there is a list of uh, um, and demo apps that if somebody wants to try out, uh, it must uh, be used. And um, maybe I'll just go and it's it's simple. Um, you you uh, fork out the code uh, and uh, let me just go back. There. Clone the uh, litmus in your own um, machine and then set up uh, the R bags properly and then uh, go to a uh, certain set of tests that you're interested and then start running it. For example, um, we are having some tests related to MySQL and then mini is an application. Uh, for example, inside uh, MySQL, there are playbooks that are. Uh, the turn the storage benchmark on MySQL, right? So you go there and then uh, run Litmus YAML file is there. Uh, you just do cuttle uh, apply minus F in this YAML. Uh, it, it installs uh, MySQL run benchmarks and reports the results into uh, currently cemented directory wherever that um, uh, host where you're running. But uh, we expect to see uh, more um, development or more contributions from us into this project on how do you actually interpret these results. For example, um, you know, we want to, to begin with, is we have MySQLU and a lot of these things are there in uh, ET uh, work of OBS, we will move to Litmus to begin with. Uh, we're trying to uh, build up uh, some automated way on how to see the results of a given test, right? Um, many times it is possible that um, the same application worked fine in my previous commit, but it's this commit really broke um, this test case. So I want to be able to compare my previous log and current logs, and um, we are planning to step an elastic B uh, and uh, some uh, insight, uh, give some insights in the results that uh, that run in each test, uh, either a given run or across multiple runs. But that's, that's probably coming in the next few months as we progress. Um, that's all I have uh, for today. And unfortunately, I'm not able to give a detailed demo, but uh, I look forward to giving a detailed demo of this litmus. Uh, in the next session. Questions? Cool. <clears throat> Thank you, Amar. Any questions?
All right. Cool. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Uma. All right. Um, so a couple things to wrap up on. Uh, on slide 25, really pointing out two things that we kind of need help with is um, uh, Sylvain and, and some folks have been doing a good job in uh, trying to piece together kind of a white paper introducing uh, chaos engineering to the CNCF uh, community and ecosystem. So I'd appreciate if people could continue to kind of uh, send pull requests and iterate uh, on that. Um, and then of course we have the landscape, uh, which um, you know I, I prefer people to add stuff to the spreadsheet uh, and make any comments on the issues as we continue to iterate there. Um, to kind of wrap things up, um, slide 27, just a reminder that um, CNCF is sponsoring Chaos Comp, which our friendly friends from Gremlin are putting on together. So hopefully, um, you know, we'll see some folks there in uh, September. Uh, also, we are going to have a kind of a chaos engineering uh, track uh, slash intro slash deep dive session at um, uh, KubeCon, CloudNativeCon in Seattle. Um, I'm going to be looking to this group to help together, uh, to put together maybe an intro and deep dive uh, presentation to the topic. So I don't know if anyone you know, wants to volunteer, but essentially my goal is to have a, a couple, two to three sessions essentially on chaos engineering there, kind of featuring an introduction to uh, you know, the overall you know, kind of topic of case engineering along with kind of a dive, a deep dive on some of the technologies out there you do it. So if you're interested in, in volunteering, uh, let me know and I'll get you kind of added uh, to, to the list uh, for sessions. Other than that, uh, I am uh, going to kind of close out this meeting and ask uh, if there's any volunteers that are willing to do a demo or, um, you know, kind of intro on their project. It would be great to, great to have you. Chris, I think I was voluntold last meeting to do yes. a deep dive on fire drill. Yep. Which is the other part of LinkedIn's um, yep. chaos engineering stack. It may have to be pre-recorded for corporate security reasons, but um, we should be able to have something for the next meeting. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it'll be in, in, in two weeks. So yep. cool. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else? Yeah. We might be able to do a detailed demo of litmus, Chris. Okay. Yeah, just let just let me know. So generally, you know, I want to fit about uh, one to two uh, demos slash presentations per per meeting. So. All right. So I think that's uh, it for now. I link the uh, Google Doc uh, for folks to volunteer at the next meeting to present. Uh, but for right now, I will tag uh, Michael as presenting on fire drill and then um, Uma as uh, tentative, um, depending on where you are in a couple of weeks. So uh, thank, thank you very much. Well, and uh, we'll meet uh, in a couple of weeks. All right, take care all. Bye -bye. Thanks everyone, thank that was awesome. You. Thanks. Thanks. Right. Thank you. See you folks.